both mics. Um, would you like to do your introdu introduction? So our fourth and final speaker today is Mike Thompson from the Open Hardware Group, where he's Director of Engineering for the Verification Task Group. Mike is a functional verification engineering manager who has been involved in all aspects of the discipline, simulation, emulation, prototyping and formal verification. He is a strong proponent of coverage driven processes in the pursuit of first time right silicon. The Open Hardware Group is a not for profit global organization driven by its members and individual contrib contributors where hardware and software designers collaborate in development of open source cores, related IP tools and software. Open hardware provides an infrastructure for hosting high quality open source hardware developments in line with industry best practices. He is based in Ontario in Canada and um, his talk today is on core five verification an open source SVUVM environment for risk five processes or cores, sorry. Over to you, Mike. All right, thank you very much for that, Mike. Uh, as, uh, as Mike said, um, I'm Mike Thompson, uh, Director of Engineering for the Verification Task Group at the Open Hardware Group. And I'm here to talk today about Core 5 Verif. I was wondering how, I, 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 I of course, before this, presentation knew about the uh, uh, speakers that were coming before me, so I knew there'd be an awful lot of discussion about verifying RISC-V cores. Uh, I, work, uh, I work with uh, Simon Davidman and the team in Empiris. They are members of the Open Hardware Group, so I had a fair idea of, of uh, you know, what his talk would be about, and of course I'm, I'm familiar with what's going on at, uh, uh, with the Shakti uh, processor team. Um, so I <clears throat> decided to change the tack of this presentation a little bit. We're not going to get into the technical details too much. I've, I've got lots of material if you want, but I'm just basically going to talk about, um, you know, the, the why fours and where hows as opposed to uh, the technical details, uh, because it's, uh, it's very interesting to me how the work that we're doing in the open hardware group is very, very similar to the things that you've already seen presented today. Uh, I won't go on to in this one too much because uh, Mike has already gone over it. We, we are a not-for-profit global organization. Um, and how does that work? Well, this, this slide can, tries to show that a little bit. So on your right-hand side is uh, the current snapshot of our members uh, page. We've got uh, more than 90 members and partners. Um, and the members are the people that do the heavy lifting, uh, you know, uh, I have this great title, Director of Engineering for the Verification Task Group. You might think that I have a team of verification engineers at my beck and call that are busily writing test cases and reference models and functional coverage and all that sort of stuff, and that's not true. I have, I have no staff. Um, the, our member companies, people like Empiris, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, all the other members that you see listed there, they are the uh, organizations that provide the human compute and tool resources that we use to develop our IP. Um, we're all, it's all centered on GitHub. Uh, it's all open source. And the idea is, is, is simple. Um, generally speaking, I act as a coordinating function to basically decide, you know, try to figure out what needs to be done next. And different uh, engineers at different member companies will pick up that work. Uh, and once it's ready for integration, contribute it to GitHub, and that's that's how our that's how our designs, that's how our specifications, and that's how our verification environments move forward. Right. Sorry, here. Yes, I want to talk a little bit about technical readiness levels. One of the things that distinguishes the Open Hardware Group from a lot of open source um, organizations is we are deliberately trying to produce IP that is as well verified as anything you can buy in the commercial space. Uh, so the, the, uh, <clears throat> the line my boss uses, Rick O'Connor, he says, you wanna walk into your director's office, slap your badge down at the table and say, I bet my career that this IP is gonna work in silicon. Now, I think that's a bit of a, uh, a stretch. Uh, I've never done that, uh, although sometimes it feels like I have. Uh, 
but that's the kind of quality that you quality that you want to have and that's the kind of quality that you actually don't get from a lot of open source ip today um, so and this is really why open hardware was uh, was created we started to use these technical readiness levels to explain to ourselves and explain to our members and explain to pr prospective members of the kinds of designs that 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 we get involved in and what kinds of quality we uh, we're, we're looking for so on the uh, on the right here this this green arrow talks about open hardware technology outputs we typically will get involved at what we call trl3 this is a proof of concept there's all probably already some rtl uh, available it's been lightly verified but not extensively verified and through working with our members we will take that down to trl5 which is which is basically rtl ip that you can integrate into your core six or seven uh, we are working on on this for for one of our designs this is where you actually have a field prototype an asic that you can buy um, so this is where we play anywhere from trl1 down to TRL7, open hardware adopters. These are the people that actually use our IP, the organizations that use our IP. They will pick up the IP somewhere around TRL5 and take it all the way to commercial applications. Uh, so we talk about these TRL levels because this is an, an externally defined uh, standard and it really helps uh, to set the expectations of everybody who gets involved. Um, so how does this boil down to verification? Um, well, this is straight off of a document which is available on Lead the Docs called the Core 5 Verification Strategy. And I'll just read it to you because it's still, I, I wrote this three years ago and it's still true. The Open Hardware Group will, together with its member companies, execute a complete industrial grade pre-silicon verification of the first generation of Core 5 IP namely the CB32E4 and CBA6 cores. Experience has shown that complete verification requires the application of dynamic I mean, simulation, FPGA prototyping, and static, formal, which are formal verification techniques. All of these techniques will be uh, applied to both of these uh, families. So there's some big statements here, uh, and I don't have enough time to get into all of them. Uh, what I will say is that three years later, this statement is still true. This is what we are currently doing. We are verifying more cores today than we than were originally listed there. There's, we're now up to seven. Uh, and we're, we've gone beyond cores to associated IP. So what are the big statements? Um, complete industrial grade pre-silicon verification. This is top to bottom, front to back verification. When you pick up a piece of uh, IP from the open hardware group that we say has uh, achieved a certain release and a certain uh, technology readiness level, you can be confident that it has. And because it's open source, you can replicate that on your own systems if you want to. Uh, we do use simulation, formal and FPGA prototyping. I'm going to be talking mostly today about simulation. Uh, but if you uh, watch this space, we will have a lot to say on the formal verification front uh, in the not too distant future. So we're big on open source implementations, but not necessarily open source tools. And this really does distinguish or the open hardware group from uh, a, lot, a lot of open source uh, activity. Um, our documentation, our test benches, our RTL are all open source. They're on GitHub right now. You can, you can Google them and, and find them. Um, but in order to achieve complete industrial grade verification, we feel that industrial quality tools are required. Um, there's, a, there's an awful lot of work going on on open source EDA tools. Um, I use them myself, um, but we have not yet found uh, a, a set of tools that will allow you to go to TRL5 and beyond um, using purely uh, open source solutions. Um, so we don't shy away from uh, using a, a closed source tool. So if you're going to use the Core 5 Verif test bench, you're going to need to buy a commercial simulator. Uh, it's, it's written in System Verilog uh, UVM. Um, we do take pains to make sure that all of our IP 
runs with all of the commercial uh, simulators that we're aware of, and there, there's five. I've got them up there on the screen. There's probably probably ones that you know, uh, probably ones that you're using. Um, but we do not um, we do not make any attempt to make sure that our uh, our verification environment will work with an open source simulator. I want to talk about verification planning because this is one of the things, as I, as, as Mike said in his, his intro to me, I'm a real big believer on metrics-driven, coverage-driven verification. You have to have a plan, and we, plan, we, we do a lot of verification planning in the Open Hardware Group. Before we start writing any test benches, before we start writing any test cases, we sit down and think about what it is that we need to do. Like, what are we verifying here? How how are we going to verify it? So we create a lot of verification plans. And once again, these are open source artifacts that are available on GitHub today. Uh, and there's lots of activity within Open Hardware Group producing these things. There's lots of them. They tend to be hierarchically organized. So there's one for high level feature. So there might be one for bus exceptions. There might be one for interrupts, one for debug one for a specific ISA like the uh, like the atomic ISA. Um, so we have for any given core, we will have a lot of these verification. Uh, we call them DB plans, uh, but basically it's 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 a document that describes what it is that we're verifying at, it, it, at a high level of detail and how it is that we know we've actually completed the verification of that. All these Core 5 Verif DV plans are open source ar artifacts, and we do this for both formal and simulation verification. I said earlier that I wasn't gonna spend too much time uh, talking about the implementation uh, of, the, of the test benches, but I just can't help myself. I've got two slides on this. Um, and this actually uh, maps uh, a lot with uh, what Neil was talking about. Uh, in, in, in his speech, it's, uh, there's an awful lot, awful lot of commonality between the architecture of the test benches that Neil was talking about and what we have in Core 5 Verif. Um, this test bench here, we call it the core test bench. It's not available for all our cores, uh, and I'll get get to uh, a reason why in a sec. Um, it, but it's it's the simplest possible test bench that I think you can imagine for a Risk 5 core or any processor core. So over here on the left-hand side, we've got a test case, which is written in assembly or perhaps in C. It will run through uh, a compiler stage to produce a, uh, a hex file for Verilog, which this yellow box is your, your uh, very, very simple Verilog test bench. The hex file is loaded into the, uh, the Verilog memory. The core starts to execute the program, and it will produce a trace log. This is this is this is a Q test bench. It can be used to uh, demonstrate uh, a platform. So if you want to if you want to actually see one of these cores in action, you can do this. Um, this is sophisticated enough to run Risk Five compliance, uh, but it's not sophisticated enough to actually close coverage for everything that was in our DB plan. For that, we use our UVM environment, um, and it. Believe it or not, this is a, a very, very close to what uh, Neil drew uh, in, in his architectural diagrams of a verification environment and very close to what uh, Simon was talking about uh, when he was talking about uh, our, the, uh, some of the RVVI stuff. And in fact, we've got RVVI in this picture. So what happens here? We have, we have a, a random instruction generator. We call it Core 5 DV because we put the Core 5 label onto everything. But really, this is the Google RISC 5 DV instruction stream generator. We, because this is written in System Verilog uh, using UVM, you can use uh, uh, object-oriented programming methods to extend it. So we do that, and those extensions we call Core 5 DV. And this produces a uh, an assembly program which we run through the same tool chain, and we load it into a memory, which is executed by the core. And we also load it into the Empiris DB reference model. And we, uh, there's a, an RVVI tracer on our course. And we use that to basically send the output of the tracer, all the instructions that get retired, down into uh, the Empiris reference model. 
and this is where we get the the checking of the architectural state of the core against the architectural state of the reference model, just as Neil was talking about earlier. Uh, we also use this to drive uh, functional coverage. Uh, we've got lots of insertions, uh, uh, system barrel log assertions embedded into the core. Um, we use a UVM agent to drive the memory, the debug, and the interrupt. The, uh, the capabilities of this test bench are basically everything that we saw before in the core test bench, plus the ability to achieve 100% core code and 100% functional coverage. And the functional coverage goals are all articulated in those DV plans I was showing earlier. So I get this a lot. I've, I've been talking, I've been um, in this role at Open Hardware for almost three years, and uh, I, I talked to a lot of people about this, and I get, I get this question a lot. This is a very detailed, heavy approach to verification. My gosh, is it really necessary? Well, it depends on your goals. Um, if you're looking for TRL3, which is basically proof of concept, I, I would argue if, you, if that's what you're looking for, that core test bench that I drew earlier is probably sufficient for your needs. Um, if, you're, if you are looking for a TRL5 piece of IP, well, the bar is going to be higher. Uh, we shoot for TRL5 uh, more or less as our default position. Uh, and for us, that means top to bottom, front to back verification. So yes, this, this approach is necessary if that is your goal. Um, our released versions of, of our IP are open source, easy to access. Uh, they have uh, open source user manuals, well-structured RTL implementation, and complete verification environments achieve, uh, capable of achieving that 100% coverage. And all of this is available on GitHub literally today. We did this one a lot. Why not just run compliance? Uh, and this is a slide from, oh, almost two years ago. Um, my position is, is that uh, the ISA compliance test suite is necessary but insufficient. It's absolutely necessary. You'd better run it. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, how, how do you know that you're actually uh, compliant with the, uh, with the, with the risk five spec? Um, but this, this uh, coverage snapshot on the left-hand side of your page shows you the, uh, the state of functional coverage after running the risk five compliance in one of our, uh, one of our cores. Um, and uh, you can see it's actually, in, in some cases, it's either, you know, low to abysmal. And for me, you know, anything less than 90% coverage is, you know, frighteningly low. You can't say you're gonna sign off. Uh, and you don't really see too much here that is beyond, like we've got- uh, Hi, Mike, uh, it's just- OBI I got one on the left. Hello. Hi, can you carry on? You've got one minute left. I've got one minute? Yes. Uh, all right, then I'd better, sh I'd better uh, uh, go quick. So I'll just wrap this up. Um, you know, we, we've done this with several cores. This is the first one we did. Uh, I always get asked about bugs, and uh, we started with something that was at TRL3. To get to TRL5, we found 47 bugs. It's up to you whether those 47 bugs are important, but, uh, but I tend to think that they are. Um, I'll just wrap up by reiterating we're a not-for-profit member-driven organization. Um, we, imply, we apply industrial practices to get quality results, and you can find us on GitHub. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Yes, sorry to rush you at the end there. Uh. Oh, no, I, was, uh, I tend to blather on. <laughs> <laughs> it was very informative, very interesting. Um, just one quick question. Um, are there any plans for open source VIPs for this client? Ah, yes, there are. Um, so one of the things that uh, Open Hardware has done in collaboration with uh, with some of our members is we we've, we've, we've defined a couple of specs um, that we use on our course. One is for a, uh, a, a memory interface. We call it the Open Bus interface. Uh, and yeah, I know what you're thinking. Yet another, yet another bus interface. We have in place today uh, verification IP, including DV plans uh, for that. 
we also have defined a, uh, uh, an attempt to standardize um, an interface to an external coprocessor, uh, which we call the Corified Extension Interface. And we are working with, uh, with a new member of the Open Hardware Group that is going to be contributing uh, verification IP for the X interface. Good. Okay, that all sounds very good. Thanks very much, Mike, for the talk. I'm sorry to cut you off a bit at the end. No, that's uh, like I say, I, I blather 